You know, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about putting our thoughts on Christ and um, thinking about and pondering what he has done, what he has said, and who he is. And tonight my goal is to just put on a pedestal some of the things that God has said in Genesis so that when we leave tonight, we might really feel more excited about clinging to Jesus than when we came. That, that's my goal. And if you'll just pray and ask the Lord to work that in your heart, I'm sure he'll do a lot better job than what I will be able to do. And so just ask him to give you the ears so that you hear what he says and you leave tonight just clinging to Jesus Christ. Uh, Genesis 1 through 12 is really foundational for the rest of the Bible. If, if you don't build upon what happens, Genesis 1 through 12, you're going to miss the the foundation of everything else that happens in Scripture. This is an incredibly important section of Scripture. And uh, I, I hope tonight, as we dig in there, you'll have had a foundation built that will enable you to see, maybe even more clearly than before, th the glory of Christ. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but in 1982... President Reagan proposed a constitutional amendment. And the constitutional amendment was for prayer in schools. And I think this is really interesting. And this is, this is just an excerpt of what he said. He said, the, the public expression through prayer of our faith in God is a fundamental part of our American heritage and a privilege which should not be excluded by law from any American school, public or private. The founders of our nation and the framers of the First Amendment did not intend to forbid public prayer. On the contrary, prayer has been a part of our public assemblies since Benjamin Franklin's eloquent request that prayer be observed by the Constitution Convention. He said, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. And then Reagan continues, he says, Just as Benjamin Franklin believed it was beneficial for the Constitutional Convention to begin each day's work with a prayer, I believe that it would be beneficial for our children to have an opportunity to begin each school day in the same manner. Since the law has been construed to prohibit this, I believe that the law should be changed. It is time for the people, through their Congress and the state legislatures, to act using the means afforded them by the Constitution. Now, part of the reason I read that to you is because I think it proves the fact that we have uh, gone from good to bad to worse. And that seems to be the pattern throughout history. You, you think about Adam and Eve, it begins really good, and then it goes to bad because they choose to rebel against God, to not believe what he said and believe what somebody else says. They have Cain and Abel, and things go to even worse when Cain kills Abel. But God steps in and he gives Adam and Eve a son to take the place of Abel, Seth. We're back to good again because the Bible says that at that point, men began to call upon the name of the Lord once again. But Cain was still alive and well, and so bad's not far around the corner. In fact, worse is right around the bend because Cain's line and Seth's line intermingle, and then we end up with the debacle before the flood where God says, everybody's so wicked, I'm just going to destroy everybody. But God, he, he shows favor, and he is truthful to his promises by saving the seed of the woman in Noah. And he begins again. He starts over with a new beginning in Noah and things are good again because Noah is given a new start, new commands. They're, they're told to fill the earth and Noah and his family honor God. They offer sacrifices. It looks like an incredibly new and wonderful beginning. And then you know from the story that it doesn't take long for sin to fit back in and things go from good to bad. And here we are in Genesis chapter 11 and we're dealing with the worse again. So let's look at Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth 
used to be the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled down. Anytime you see the word going to the east in the first 10 chapters of Genesis, that's, that's a pretty good indication things are not good. Um, and so you see that, that's like a, a, a signal for you. Things are not going to be good in this little story. So they go and they settle there and they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. So God tells Noah and his children, you need to fill the earth, multiply in it. The people of God say, um, no. Um, all the lineage after Noah, they say we're going to stay together. Now, if you notice in chapter 10, verse 32, that it said, these are the families of sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations. Out of these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Well, how did they get separated? Well, this is the story of how it happened, because that's not what they intended to do. They intended to all stay together in, in rebellion, really, to what God said. And so here they are. They're building this city, and look at the characteristics of what they're doing. It says, we're going to build ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach to the heaven. We're going to make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll have to do what God wants. And so they basically said, we want to be self-sufficient. We want to build a great city so that we're great and we don't need anything else except ourselves. And so they have bent themselves towards self-sufficiency in building this city. And God... In verse 5, this is, this is humor, okay? This is biblical humor, and you've got you to see this and kind of laugh a little bit because it's what it's intended to make you do. Um, it's kind of a mockery here. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Okay, so the sons of men are going to build a tower that reaches all the way to heaven. This magnificent thing is going to make a name for themselves, and what does the Bible say that God's perspective on that tower is? Pretty puny. I've got to come, the omniscient God's got to come all the way down from heaven just to see the great tower that men have built. So the men have this lofty goal, and God says, that's not real lofty because you're not working according to my plan. So God comes down, and he sees what they're doing, and he has a response to it. Verse 6, the Lord said, behold, they are one people. They all have the same language, and this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be outside of their possibility, will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down, and therefore, and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth and from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So God comes down and he sees what they're doing. And what he sees is that they are pursuing a path of complete self-sufficiency in order that I might not be included in their lives at all. They don't need me. And if they continue down this path, they're not going to see a need for me. And so God steps in with judgment because they have rebelled against what he said. And he judges them for what they're doing. Now, I want you to notice that in his judgment, once again... He displays incredible grace. You, you see it all the way through the first 10 chapters of Genesis. Every time there's judgment, grace always shows up because the message through Genesis 1 through 12 is that God's grace will prevail over sin and death, over judgment. God's grace is going to prevail. And so here again we see God's judgment come upon the city of Babel and it is a picture of judgment and grace because God has a plan. And his grace is going to unfold it no matter what sin is occurring. God is gracious, even in judgment, because he wants his plan of rescuing humanity and getting them back from the curse of sin and death to unfold. And so what God does is he scatters them all over the earth, which is 
enabling them to fulfill what he originally commanded. Now, they're not willfully choosing to do it. God is forcing them to do it. But in forcing them to do it is a gracious thing. It's giving them an opportunity once again to respond to him. He spreads them out so they will not stay in their self-sufficiency and gives them an opportunity to call upon him. You see the grace in the judgment? He's going to judge them. He sends them out just like he originally said, and he does it in a way that they cannot continue down the path that is away from him but not have an opportunity because of his judgment to turn back to him. But they don't do it. Instead of turning back to the Lord, they all go in their separate directions and they build other little cities all over the place which end up being just little babbles all over the earth. And the earth becomes a place, once again, of darkness, of rebellion, where the curse of sin and death has its grip on humanity. But that does not mean there's not hope. I mean, the two places that Scripture paints a picture of the darkness of sin and the depravity of humanity is Genesis chapter 6 and right here in Genesis chapter 11. And in both places, we see an incredible picture of God's grace and how it will prevail over all sin. And that's what we get here, a picture of hope. Because right after we hear about what God does to judge and everybody's scattered all over the earth, we get this this list of the descendants of Shem. And that's not just any old genealogical list inserted there so we have to read a bunch of names of who begat who. That's not the purpose here. There's something going on here that you should not miss, all right? Now, to get this, you got to go back to Genesis chapter 5. Now, remember, in Genesis chapter 3 is the fall of humanity. Adam and Eve fall. Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Things are really bad. Genesis chapter 5 is a list of Adam's genealogy. And one of the things you'll notice when you read that list, now, now remember what happened when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. God's told them, you're going to die. Then we see death come when Cain kills Abel. And then we get the list of all of Adam's descendants. And guess what phrase is repeated over and over and over again in Genesis chapter 5? Adam lived, uh, dot, 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 and he died. And he died. And he died. Again and again and again in Genesis chapter 5. Because the stress in that genealogical list is on the curse of sin and death that's gripped all of humanity. And right after Genesis chapter 5 comes Genesis chapter 6 where everything is horrible and we see the outcome of the curse of sin and death on all of humanity such that God is now going to kill everybody except Noah. And out of Noah comes a new beginning. Now... In Genesis chapter 11, we're back to humanity expressing the ultimate curse of sin and death. Everything's dark. Everything's rebellious. And then we get this this genealogical list again. But this time, it's with Shem's line. And we've already heard previously when Noah was talking about his kids that he blessed Shem. So Shem is the blessed line. That's a clue for us earlier in Genesis that something's unique with Shem. Then we get this genealogical list of Shem's descendants. And notice the word that's repeated here, verses 10 through 26. Lived, lived, lived. Not one single time is the word died in this entire list. This is a signal to us that something is happening here. Something's different here in the midst of rebellion. God is about to unveil grace. He's about to do something to overturn or reverse the curse of sin and death. And he doesn't even mention death. He just mentions life because something's going to happen here that is another new beginning, a complete and total reversal of the curse of sin and death. It starts right here. And verse 27 You see the phrase, now these are the records of the generations of Terah. There's your new beginning. Right there, that's your signal. Another generation has been mentioned. And this is the beginning that leads to Abram, the son of Terah. So notice in verse 27, let's read that together. Now these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot, and Haran died in the presence of the fa- his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. 
Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves, and the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, and the father of Milcah was Iscah. And Sarai was barren. She had no child. Now, the reason these people are listed out, these are significant players. We've just entered a segment of Genesis that for the next 39 chapters is going to unfold what is essentially the building blocks of the gospel. All right? And so we've been given these characters because they're significant for what's going to be unfolding in the future. Then 31, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, and his grandson, and Sarai, and his daughter-in-law, his son's son, Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran, settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. That's significant that the scripture says that Terah died there, and I'll get to that in just a second, but You notice that Abram and his family, his father, they're all on their way to the land of Canaan. You know what that is, don't you? That's the promised land. So Abram and his dad and a few other relatives leave Ur of the Chaldeans and head towards the promised land, but they get stuck in Haran. And Abram doesn't leave again until his dad dies. And when his dad dies, he leaves. Now, chapter 12, verse 1, is God's lofty plan. You know, you ha- in chapter 11, you have man's lofty plan. We're going to build a city. That didn't work out so good because every man thinks there's a way that's right to him, but the scripture says that way ends in death. Didn't work out so good. Well, God's unfolding his plan here in the person of Abram. And his plan is one that is absolutely spectacular. And I I just love how these two fit together and demonstrate to us that no matter what sin we're involved in, God's grace can prevail. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house through the land which I will show you And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curses curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay, did you catch what God said? Go and leave your father's household. Whoops. We got a little problem here, don't we? Because he just said, that he didn't. His dad went with him and they got stuck. Now, now think through this with me, all right? The entire earth is in rebellion and darkness, all right? Everybody is calling upon any other God except the one true God. That includes Abram. Abram is an idolater. He worships idols. Joshua, chapter 24, confirms that and tells us that Joshua is a worshiper of idols. He's just like everybody else. He is sinful. He's a worshiper of idols. He has a propensity to sin. We're going to see that mapped out. We already see it here briefly alluded to in the fact that when he left, he took his dad. I mean, there's nothing about Abram that merits what God is doing in coming to Abram. It's grace. Do you see the difference between what God does when men are building the city? God comes down and sees the tower and brings judgment on them. And here in the midst of all this rebellion and darkness, no one calling upon the name of the Lord, God comes down again, but this time with grace to once and for all prevail over the cause for judgment, sin and death. And God comes to Abram Not because he deserves it. Not because he's done anything that merits any favor from God. Abram doesn't care about God. But God comes anyway. God comes because of grace. And he issues a call to Abram. It's a call of faith. And it's a call 
to promises. And, and something spectacular happens here with Abram. You see, God says, I want you to do this. I want you to follow me, and I'm going to promise you these things. Now think through this. If, if Abram says yes and he follows God, which he does, not perfectly, which is grace, if Abram says yes and follows God, how is it that Abram's going to experience these promises unless Abram is forgiven for his sin? See, when, when Abram places his faith in God to go, he is operating on credit. Because not long after this, he's going to trust in God and God's going to say, it has been given to you through your faith, righteousness, forgiveness. God's going to give forgiveness to Abraham through his faith so that he might experience these promises that are absolutely astounding. Look at these promises that God gives. Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house. I can't imagine doing that, traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles into a foreign land. You don't even know where it is. You're having to leave all your family. You're, you, you just met this God who says he's the God and you're following. It's crazy that he's, he's going and he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so you shall be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. I'm going to bless every family in all the earth. Did you, did you catch the um, foreshadowing of the reversal of the curse of sin and death in these promises? Y you see, what happens in um, the city of Babel, when men are building their city, they're trying to make a great name for themselves. They're trying to make themselves a wonderful nation. And guess what? That doesn't work out so good because if you do it your way, you will not experience God's blessing. But here Abraham is out there doing nothing to honor God, doing nothing to merit anything. God shows up and says, hey, I want to do this for you. Will you believe in me? And Abraham says, I'll believe. And guess what happens? He gets something he does not deserve, which is the very cry of the entire world. And he gets it simply because he believes. And he only gets it because he believes in the God of grace. And what does he get? What's he get? What he gets is his name will be great. That's what the, Bab the, town, the city of Babel was all about, making a great name for themselves. Now Abraham gets it given to him by grace through faith. They want to be a great nation. Guess what you're going to be, Abram? A great nation. How? Through faith because of grace. Did he deserve it? No. Was God prevailing over sin? Yes. How is he doing it? Grace. And the last promise he says, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That right there is the phrase that we are to understand as the reversal of, this, of the curse of sin and death. You see, in humanity, all the families, in Adam, all the families of the earth were cursed with sin and death. But now, in Abram, God is going to bless all the families of the earth. He's going to reverse the curse. How is he going to do that? That right there, that phrase, is the gospel message. The only way God is able to reverse the curse that Adam instilled on all humanity through Abram is through Jesus Christ. Now flip over with me to, to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 verse 6. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. What Abraham heard when he heard God's promise was the gospel. And Abraham believed it. And through his faith, a seed comes in the person of Jesus Christ who reverses completely the curse of sin and death. Jesus Christ is the way that God prevails over all sin. And it is strictly by grace. There are two things you need to recognize in your own life. Number one, forgiveness. 
just like Abraham, you've got to recognize that all your sin is forgiven in and through faith in Jesus Christ. That the reversal of the curse of sin and death comes through faith and faith alone. You don't merit forgiveness. You don't merit God's favor. There's nothing you do that has made you deserving of forgiveness. And listen to this. Everything you've done has made you as least a candidate for forgiveness as anything anyone else has ever done. Did you catch that? So, so sometimes I think it's easy to think of ourselves a whole lot better than what we really are. When the reality is, you think of the worst, most reprobate, depraved person you could ever imagine, and they're no more least deserving than you for forgiveness. Forgiveness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. We've had the curse of sin and death reversed because of what Christ has done simply by putting our faith in him. Reversed. And the second thing you've got to realize is the promises of Christ. The promises that are ours through faith in Christ. This is the gospel message that that grace prevails over all sin. And that grace prevailing over all sin for you and I means forgiveness and the experience of, of having in our possession and in our future all the promises of God. And I love how um, this idea of, of Babel, men building a city, conveys the reversal of our fortune for the future so that in Christ we get to experience the promises of God. All right? So here in Babel, People under the judgment of God are scattered all over the earth and they, they speak different languages so that they have to gather in these cities and build all these little babbles. Okay, so that's the picture of the world. When Christ comes and he displays the full gospel message of grace through faith, what does his spirit do when he comes in the day of Pentecost? He fills 12 guys with the ability to speak a language that was not their own and they speak to the nations of the world that are gathered at the temple and everybody from their region is able to hear the gospel message in their language so that now instead of confusion through languages because of judgment there is understanding through languages because of grace and everybody there hears the gospel message and is able to place their faith in Christ and experience the reversal of sin and death so that they might then be a testimony to the entire world so that everyone might know that Jesus Christ is the way to blessing. It's amazing. Not only that, but we have the promise that in Jesus Christ, God is going to deliver a whole brand new city. So you see, men in Babel were trying to build a city that was great and make a name for themselves. God says, no, that's not going to happen. They stopped building the city. Why? Because there is another city that is, that is God's plan of grace. And if you look at Revelation chapter 21, look over there with me. Revelation chapter 21. Verse 10 says, He carried me in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Then, then skip down to verse 22. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. God has built another city and that city is the one in which we are to dwell through faith in Jesus Christ because of the work of Christ and the grace he's poured out on us and that is the place where because of God's great name we experience everything our soul has longed for. It's Jesus. It's only Jesus. And if you want to experience the reversal of the curse of sin and death, you simply cling 
to Jesus. You cling to him no matter what. And you keep on clinging. And you keep on holding. And you keep on believing. Because his grace will always prevail over sin. Even out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24 says, Faithful is he who calls you, and he will bring it to pass. No matter what sin is in your life, God's grace can prevail if you cling to Jesus. No matter what sin is in the life of those around you. God's grace can prevail. So tell them about Jesus. That's the gospel. And it's from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's there. We need to cling to him and proclaim him.